Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jennifer Whiteside. I'm BC's uh, Minister of Education. I would like to acknowledge I am speaking to you today from the traditional territory of the Lekungwin speaking people of the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations. Today, we're providing an update on back to school planning for September. But before we look at what's ahead, I want to take a moment to extend my profound gratitude to teachers, school staff, and administrators. You have worked with compassion, strength, and determination. You have shown remarkable fortitude and leadership while supporting the changing needs of students throughout this unprecedented year. And I also want to thank parents and families for your tremendous commitment and hard work in ensuring your children have been able to learn in spite of the challenges of the pandemic. Our government has been and continues to be committed to following the direction and guidance of public health and working collaboratively with our education partners and with rights holders. The way we have all worked together uh, throughout this year has been remarkable. I think it really reaffirms the, the compassionate, resilient and caring nature of British Columbians. The vast majority of students returned to class full time this school year. We had school safety plans in place to reduce the spread of COVID and the evidence shows that these plans were indeed successful. There's no question it was a difficult year and in some parts of the province much more challenging than others. Since the start of the 2021 school year, the vast majority of schools in BC have been open and operating every day of the school year. And British Columbians are showing just how much they care about each other by getting vaccinated at amazing rates. It is expected that all eligible British Columbians will have been offered both vaccination doses by September, which is fantastic news. And we will hear more from uh, Dr. Henry on that front in a moment. So what this means is that students will be back in the classroom for full-time in-person instruction and the return to a near normal start to school in September. Based on guidance from the Office of the Provincial Health Officer, students will no longer be grouped into uh, cohorts or learning groups. 
pending a further public health guidance. It's also expected that current restrictions on gatherings, extracurricular activities and sports will be relaxed in time for the new school year. And that's good news for everyone. I know that we want to move past the pandemic together and we're currently moving in the right direction. To support the safe operation of schools and the health and safety of students and staff, today we're announcing a total of $43.6 million. This includes new COVID-specific one-time funding of $25.6 million for the next school year. And that is on top of the $7.1 billion we announced in Budget 2021 to operate K-12 schools in BC. The $25.6 million in new one-time funding will be used to continue enhanced cleaning measures in schools and support the continuation of rapid response teams and used to support Indigenous students affected by the pandemic, as well as improving mental health services and supports for students and staff to address the impacts of isolation, stress and anxiety due to the pandemic. Our mental health working group will continue to meet and develop strategies and assess uh, and recommend mental health resources to support students and staff. We know the pandemic has not only impacted mental health, but has also impacted learning and educational equity. Early research is showing that those students most impacted are those who already faced structural barriers, including students living in poverty, Indigenous students, English language learners, and those who need more support in schools. And nothing's more important than addressing inequality and ensuring each and every child reaches their full potential in school. And that's why $18 million will directly address learning impacts to students. While school districts will have some flexibility to use uh, that uh, in how they use that $18 million, we, we want uh, to ensure that, that, uh, that, 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 those, uh, that, that those resources are used to meet local needs uh, and that funding is intended to um, assess learning impacts on students due, the, due to the pandemic, develop and deliver additional resources to address learning impacts and to deliver recovery strategies designed by school districts. Guidance on mask wearing in school settings will be confirmed later this summer and will align with broader provincial direction. What will remain the same uh, is that uh, we, we will expect students and staff to continue to complete daily health checks, stay home when they feel sick and practice diligent hand hygiene. With more than 50% of, uh, of children age 12 to 17 already receiving their first dose of vaccine, and those numbers continue to grow, we can plan for a much more typical school year starting in the fall. Our provincial K-12 steering committee, which is made up of educators, parents, support workers, school leaders, trustees, representatives from the First Nations Education Steering Committee and the Métis Nation BC, as well as public health experts, has been absolutely invaluable in navigating the pandemic and keeping our schools safe this year. We will continue to work with the committee and the BC Centre for Disease Control over the summer to review and finalize health and safety guidelines for the fall. We will continue to follow the guidance and direction of public health and follow the evidence when making decisions. I'm very proud of the work that has been done by everyone to ensure that BC is one of the few jurisdictions to develop and implement a system-wide plan to keep our schools open and safe this school year. That accomplishment and commitment to keeping schools open is a testament to the tireless work of our education and health professionals, along with the dedication of students, parents and families throughout BC. We're committed to continuing to work together so that we can pr prepare for a safe and a near normal return to school in September. And now I realize I was remiss earlier on in not uh, acknowledging our guests um, today. We, I'm here today with uh, uh, our provincial health officer, Dr. Dr. Henry, as well as Stephanie Higginson, uh, president of the uh, BC School Trustees Association. And we're joined uh, uh, as well by Andrea Sinclair, the president of the BC Confederation of um, Parent Advisory Committees. And you're gonna have a chance to hear a little bit from all of them, uh, starting with uh, Dr. Henry. Thank you very much and good morning. We know that this has been a challenging year. 
and we've been using that word a lot for everyone. But we have adapted and we've learned, and we've learned a lot about COVID-19 over this past 18 months. And despite all of the challenges, educators, um, schools have been open and uh, school staff have supported our children and families across the province. Being in class is more than just education, as important as that is. We know it's about social, physical, emotional and mental health as well. And it is so, so important. We heard unequivocally in when we had to close schools early on before uh, we had a better understanding of how this virus was transmitted, that it impacted families and communities across the board. And it was important for us to commit to making that a priority as we moved into the fall this year. That the school community is essential to the well-being of families and communities across the province. And I am so proud that working together we have supported the safe reopening and continued opening of in-class schools throughout this year, this most challenging year. And it really is a testament to the dedication of educators and school staff across British Columbia. But we are now in a time of transition where we can safely restart and get some of those important social connections back together. We are gradually progressing with our BC Restart program with a focus on putting the pandemic behind us and learning how we can move ahead and live with COVID-19 in a way that is much more fulsome than we have been. And this, um, the reason we can do this is because we have safe and effective vaccines that are protecting people across British Columbia. Our goal in particular for our schools is to get to the point that we can take the same approach that we do now with other communicable diseases, whether it's influenza or measles, where we can manage them on a local basis, on an individual basis, without having those broad impacts on society that we have had this past year. We will continue to actively monitor for COVID and other infectious diseases and work with our schools to make sure they continue to be safe. And we will continue to do that public health work to manage and contain spread in our communities as well. Over the next months of summer, we can start to gradually remove the orders and restrictions as more and more people are protected through immunization. That means by September, we will be back to a much more normal school experience. The safety layers we use today are very important tools in our toolbox and we will need to be ready to use them if needed as we move into the fall. But some we'll be able to take away and we've talked a little bit about some of those today. Others will continue. We will always need to clean our hands regularly. We know that's important. Staying home when you're sick, getting tested if symptoms develop. We are on a very good trajectory, but I will reassure everybody we will be watching this carefully and will continue to do so as we move through the summer and we will be developing our plans in concert with all of the team at the provincial level to make sure that schools are ready in the fall. Planning will continue to be based on evidence, on data and on learning as we go. We know that even though we will be emerging from the pandemic, we will still need to watch and manage COVID and other respiratory illnesses in the fall. And we will be updating our, our health and safety guidelines and advice to schools uh, with the BC CDC as we move through the summer. Public health teams will also continue to work with every single school and with the provincial team to make sure that schools are ready in September for the best possible return to typical in fall setting as much as we can. To the educators, staff and administrators, I am so grateful for all that you have put into this year. I know it has been hard in some cases, but you have done this and it has been so, so important for our families and our communities. And to parents, thank you for your support as well, even when things were very much in flux through many parts of this past year. It has not always been easy, but the adaptability, resilience and strength of our school communities and our youth has really shone through here in BC. And finally, I want to say congratulations to those who are graduating this year. This is an experience 
that was much different, I'm sure, than you were expecting. But it is also something that you have overcome. And in successfully overcoming the obstacles that you did this year, that is something you will take with you for the rest of your life. And know that you have that strength and resilience when things get tough in your future. But I want to say congratulations. You've done an amazing job through a very challenging year, and I think that is reason to celebrate for everybody. Thank you very much. I'll now turn it over to uh, over. Do you want to introduce to Stephanie Higginson to say a few words? Good morning. I'm honored to be on the territories of the Kwangan speaking peoples of the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nations. And I too want to begin by acknowledging that the COVID-19 pandemic has been hard on all of us. It's been hard on communities, it's been hard on businesses, and it's been hard on families. It has been particularly difficult for children and youth who have lost connections to supports and sacrificed activities and experiences that so many of us remember so fondly from our own formative years. Schools are where we learn, they're where our early social and emotional learning takes place, they are also where we make lifelong connections to friends, to teachers, to mentors, to teams, and activities that shape our lives. In British Columbia, we have been fortunate. Boards of Education, in cooperation with the Ministry of Education and the Provincial Health Office, pulled out all the stops to keep students in school all year, all year long to make sure that learners would benefit from the critical supports provided by schools. We are proud that British Columbia prioritized the health and well-being of children and youth by keeping schools open for the entire school year. Together, we proved that with the appropriate health and safety measures in place, education can and should be a priority even during a global pandemic. It was a monumental task that asked a lot of every person in this sector and everyone rose to the challenge. And we did so because of how much we care for the students we serve. We are grateful to everyone for the sacrifices they made in recognition of the critical role schools play in the lives of students, communities, and society at large. Thank you to the dedicated staff across the entire K-12 sector who made all of this possible. Each and every one of you played an integral role in this extremely complicated but very successful school year. And thank you to the families and students who worked hard to comply with the safety measures that made this school year possible. It's been extraordinarily difficult, but it has been successful, and this year will set us up for a smoother transition into our recovery phase. And with hope on the horizon, we can look back and feel tre a tremendous sense of achievement at the incredible efforts we took to keep kids in school during this very challenging school year. Building on the same diligence and care, I am grateful and relieved to be here today delivering a message of hope based on the most up-to-date science that has guided BC so successfully through this pandemic. We are here today to signal the first careful steps towards a pandemic recovery school year. Boards of Education will continue to work with their local medical health officers to create return to school plans that parallel the province's staged recovery plan. Boards will work with the same thoughtfulness demonstrated this school year to meet the needs of students as we transition to a post-pandemic world. We recognize and we understand that the pandemic has impacted each community differently and each Board of Education will build a COVID-19 recovery plan that meets the nuanced needs of the communities that they serve. Over the last year and a half, British Columbians in every community pulled together to keep each other safe. As we move forward, boards will continue working with their communities to keep learning, keep kids learning, growing, and thriving in every part of the province. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephanie. And I'd now like to turn it over to Andrea Sinclair, the president of the BC Confederation of Parent Advisory Committees. Good morning and thank you, Minister Whiteside. I acknowledge I am speaking today from my home on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. I'm Andrea Sinclair and I'm the president of the BC Confederation of Parent Advisory Councils. BC CPAC is the provincially mandated voice of parents who represents over 565,000 students attending public schools. I wish to thank our dedicated board and our CEO. 
Together, we have attended over 125 meetings since March 2020. I am proud to say BCCBAC has worked diligently to bring the parent perspective and voice to each committee and influence decisions and policies. As has already been noted, it has been a challenging year for us all. I understand these challenges firsthand as I have two children in high school. By working together, our schools have remained open and safe. By doing so, children were able to benefit from the social and emotional supports offered at their neighborhood school. It also meant our children were able to have consistency in their lives by ensuring that their daily routines would remain. By schools remaining open, it meant our children could continue to interact with peers and trusted adults. It also allowed our children to take advantage of the much needed supports like breakfast and hot lunch programs. As I took my place on the K-12 steering and restart committees, I was impressed with how hard parents, educators, support staff, healthcare experts, and ministry personnel worked as a team to ensure that schools met health and safety guidelines. I'm grateful to each of our education partners for their knowledge, effort, and dedication. Through this experience, I am more confident than before that our school system can overcome any adversity it may face. There is no substitute for the in-class experience, and that is why we support the K-12 recovery plan and the return to school in September, where all students can be back learning full-time in their classrooms. Children and families can expect that their school and school district will be prepared, responsive, and flexible in meeting individual student needs, including acknowledging and addressing impacts from the pandemic on learning, mental health, and well-being. It's been a time of adaptation for all of us, children, families, and school staff. It's now time for parents to return to our schools to help reinvigorate our communities. It's now time for parent advisory councils to re-engage with their families. It is important for us to share with families today so that they can plan and adapt for September, but also find time to rest, recharge, and reset over the summer. And as we look with hope to September and the near normal return to school, BCC PAC will continue working with our provincial education partners and the ministry throughout the summer to finalize the plans for September while continuing to take our lead from the PHO. We will keep members and families informed as information is available. We have listened and learned from each other. We have supported and leaned on each other. The phrase, it takes a village, has never been truer. Thank you. Thank you so much for those comments, Andrea. And uh, now we have uh, some time for questions. Thank you very much, Minister. A reminder to reporters on the line, please press star one to enter the queue. You are limited to one question and one follow-up. Please also ensure you come off speakerphone before asking your question. First question, we go to Lisa Yuzda, News 1130. Good morning. I'm, I guess this is probably mostly for Dr. Henry. You know, well, there are many people that are excited going back to school. There is a, a, a loud group of people who are still very worried and say that, that it isn't safe. And I'm just wondering at this point, is there anything more that you can say to reassure those people who say that there are not enough protections, that say the province hasn't done enough to improve air quality, and that things are being pushed too quickly when kids under 12 will not be vaccinated returning to school in the fall? Is there anything you can say to reassure those people who just have not been reassured yet and are still frightened? Lisa, thanks for that question. Maybe I'll just start before handing it over to Dr. Henry, uh, particularly around the uh, the question around ventilation and the investments that that have been made. Um, we we have uh, seen school districts invest significant sums of money in uh, upgrading uh, ventilation systems throughout this year. Th those investments will uh, will continue, and we in fact have a ventilation. Um, uh, committee uh, that uh, that where where we have uh, ministry staff uh, working uh, with uh, uh, with educators and administrators to identify those areas where we still may need need to be making improvements. So that work is all ongoing, uh, and uh, we 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 won't be really stopping any of that during the summer, so that we can prepare for for a safe for a safe start in uh, in September. And I'll just turn it over to Dr. Henry for the rest. 
Sure, and, th and thank you. And, uh, you know, as you mentioned, ventilation is one of the important things that we've learned. And we've learned uh, that there are some situations that are riskier than others. But in terms of schools, we put in a lot of restrictions, a lot of trying to um, reduce mingling, all of those things that we um, were uh, sort of putting in place as much as we possibly could early on, and we've learned from that. We've learned that actually structured environments with children are not that risky, which is good. We've learned that transmission is rare in those settings when we have a structured setting like a school. Um, when we reduce the numbers of people that are coming and going on an ongoing basis, that makes a difference. So we've taken all of those things that we've learned. But I think the most important thing that we have on our side going into next fall is the fact that we've protected so many people in our province and in our communities through vaccination. So having safe and effective vaccines approved uh, affects everybody. It means that transmission doesn't happen in the ways that we've seen it happen in communities in the past few months. And we're, that's what we will see going into the fall. We're confident in that. What we are learning is how long the vaccines protect for, and we uh, have more information about that as we're going on. The fact that two doses is important. And even if young children um, are not uh, immunized. We know that they, one, aren't going to be infected as often, uh, that they are protected from the adults and older children around them uh, being protected, and that they're less likely uh, to have severe effects from COVID anyway. So um, it is important that we get all of the adults and older uh, children um, immunized and with their two doses, and we sh we're on track to have that happen well before September. So that gives us a lot of, of benefit going into this next year and means that we can get back to a much more normal year. It doesn't mean it's going to be perfect. There are still things we don't yet know about how this virus transmits, about what's going to happen next respiratory season when we know uh, these types of viruses, coronaviruses spread more easily. So those are the things that we will continue to watch and work together. But it is reassuring that even through the, the peak of our third wave, uh, we had very little transmission. We had quite a lot of exposure events and those were concerning and we managed those. And the school teams worked very hard to make sure that uh, transmission was, was still rare in, in the, health, in the uh, school setting. Lisa, do you have a follow-up? Yes, and you mentioned going into the respiratory season in the fall. What might that look like? I mean, if you're giving up cohorts for the younger kids, those are obviously the ones that are going to be more at risk. Might it look like classes being sent home again, like with that kind of exposure notice? Are those things still going to happen? Like, what are things that are going to continue on um, to alert parents if there is concern in their kids' classes? Uh, in schools? Yeah, so um, that's a really good question. Those are the things that we're working out with public health. So we will continue to do case management, understanding every case um, that's transmitted. We'll be also, um, we have started our, our overall surveillance. So very much like what we do for influenza, where we do systematic testing of people in the community with respiratory symptoms to understand what is it that is circulating in our communities. So in some communities, if we start to see transmission of COVID, um, we will take those measures and, and make sure that the communities are aware and there may be that we need to step up screening. It may be that uh, some classes may need to uh, to make sure that children are staying home and that they will need to, will be notifying families. So we'll be working with the schools and it is probable. We have it every year where we have influenza clusters that happen in schools and we'll be managing them the same way, working with every single school, every community. But what we don't expect to see is that need to widespread shut things down across the board because it will, it, most people being protected means that it's not going to spread in the same way. Next question, Lisa Cardasco, Vancouver Sun. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering why there isn't anyone from the BC Teachers Federation with you for this announcement today. Um, we, we have, uh, 
I have to say I am I am extremely proud of the work that our government has done in working collaboratively with partners in all sectors across all of uh, across all ministries um, in, in government. In education, we have a provincial steering committee uh, that is comprised of educators, the BCTF, the the QP staff, uh, administrators, trustees, parents, public health. It and that group has worked together since last spring um, to keep this uh, to to keep schools safe and keep, and keep them open. Uh, the work is very collaborative. We have ongoing uh, groups uh, uh, addressing mental health issues, addressing addressing ventilation. So the work that is done to support keeping kids in school has been extremely collaborative, and will and that that's the way we'll continue as we prepare for uh, the reopening in September. Lisa, do you have a follow up? Yes, um, Dr. Henry, you say that you know you, the school plan will be guided by evidence and data, but you yourself have said in the past that you aren't gathering as much information about schools and transmissions as you'd like. So, how can parents trust that their children will be safe in school? Yeah, it you know, uh, what I have said is that it is very challenging. We don't have uh, microchips in every child and every teacher to be able to know exactly who transmitted to whom. But on a local level, an individual level, we have a lot of work that has been done by local public health officers, our school health officers, our teams working with schools. And we do have a good understanding of, of what was happening in schools across the province. And that means uh, we've presented some of the studies. There was a very in-depth one done by Vancouver Coastal, another one done by Fraser Health, the two areas where we had the most transmission in communities, and that was reflected in exposure events that happened in schools. And those data are, are the same in both of those studies through two different periods of time that show that transmissions with the, the measures that we had in place in schools were very rare. So that is reassuring to all of us, and we will continue to have um, robust surveillance in our communities and in our schools as we go into the fall. And I think it is a testament. We can see that uh, not only were cases unusual and rare, but there was not an increased transmission in schools relative to the community. What happened in schools reflected what happened in our communities. And now, with the immunization that we have and the protection in our communities that we have from vaccines, we expect that all of that will come down, as we've been seeing in the last few months and weeks. Next question, Camille Baines, Canadian Press. Hi there, this is for the Minister. I'd like to get some details on the mental health supports that will be provided for students, particularly those uh, students who already were struggling with mental health issues. Uh, can you provide details on the number of people that will be hired? Because there were staffing shortages to help them before. What will happen now? Thanks very much for uh, for that, Camille. And it, it will be really up to districts to develop plans that are um, that are responsive to their local their local situations. But we have a uh, we er, er, early on uh, this year we we we, we struck a, a working group of a subgroup of our provincial steering committee to specifically address. Um, uh, mental health, uh, mental health issues, and really, school districts have done some very remarkable things with the funding that was already made available during this school year. Whether it was in hiring additional uh, child and youth workers, or developing programs, in some cases, peer programs where students could get involved in um, developing uh, programs for um, f in, in conjunction with uh, with supporting their peers. So it will be, I expect, a combination of, of counseling supports of particular uh, particular programs that districts may have already developed this year that they will continue to uh, to have in place. Um, we, uh, we we will, we have also made uh, an investment in in budget 2021 uh, with respect to increasing the number of child uh, and youth in integrated uh, teams. Those teams are uh, are uh, a combination of of um, health staff and and school district staff, and those uh, that is a project that Mr. Minister Malcolmson and I are, are working to uh, to ramp up and to to provide because we know that those those teams will be very important in supporting schools uh, throughout uh, throughout this year and the coming years. Camille, do you have a follow-up? 
Yes, I do. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to know whether some students will have the choice to continue learning remotely, especially if they, they are struggling. We, we have not asked boards to, um, to continue with the transition programs. There were, uh, by, by their very nature, we had, we had uh, asked districts in the, at the, as part of the 20, uh, the, the restart plan last August to, uh, ensure that they had provisions for, for online learning for those children who were, uh, even compromised or who weren't able to be, uh, to be in school. Uh, those programs, uh, will no longer be in place. We will be ensure that uh, asking districts to work with their local parents and in those situations where there are children who uh, who aren't able to be in school we have a number of other online very robust uh, online programs that um, that that those those children can transition to next question Richard Zussman Global News uh, the BCTF has already said that they would like to see masking in September they would like to see uh, pretty similar situations to now and then ease back into normal uh, why is there no commitment to have similar plans now or in September as we do now? And, and Dr. Henry, do you believe that masks worked in schools to help cut down on transmission in classrooms? Uh, maybe just just before turning it over to, to Dr. Henry for the for the masks uh, um, in particular, I w with respect to the plan, the we we're currently at the second stage of our uh, plan that was developed last summer. We'll continue at that stage throughout uh, until we transition to this new set of guidelines, which we expect uh, to do in uh, in in August. So uh, those and I think that folks will find that that is a fairly uh, will will be a gradual transition and will be in line with. With what um, with what families and everybody is experiencing, sort of in in the rest of their in the rest of their of their lives. So I we've been prudent in not making a dramatic um, uh, change uh, now uh, to uh, to something different, but uh, are are preparing the ground and will continue to work on the summer to ensure that um, that the uh, that the transition is uh, is is manageable for everybody. And now I'll just ask Dr. Henry about the masks. So it is, um, you know, we are in a very different place than right now. So we should not expect that things will be the same in September. And that's because we have safe and effective vaccines. And we prioritize school staff and educators uh, to receive vaccines for that very reason. We know that having that group of adults who are most at risk in the, the school setting would protect both them and the children that they uh, uh, that we're in the classroom. So th that is a really important thing. The fact that we have vaccines that work and work very effectively puts us in a completely different place. It's what is going to take us out of this pandemic. And then we have to learn to how do we manage to live with a virus that's going to pop up now and then. And we, we don't yet know how badly it's going to cause uh, uh, outbreaks or clusters or spread in our community this next fall. So. We shouldn't expect that we would have the same things in place in September, given that we have such great levels of immunity now in our community. Having said that, uh, masks are one of the uh, layers of protection. It's the sort of last layer of last resort, if you will. And when we had high levels of transmission in our communities, mask wearing became more important as that protection both from me uh, passing it to you, but also some protection for me as well. So, but it primarily is about keeping droplets in. And those are the things that, uh, that were important when we had a lot of transmission of this virus and important in settings like school settings. We do know of well uh, that in some of the younger children um, that mask wearing was uh, a challenge for them and so we need to balance that. So I don't expect we'll be in that situation in the, the coming school year where, where we'll need that level of support all the time. But there may be situations if we have clusters in our community, if the, the rates go up in a specific area, then we may recommend mask wearing in certain situations. But it is what we're going to have to get used to too uh, as we transition through restart in our community. We're going to go back to having low rates of transmission in our community and mask wearing being important in some indoor settings more than others. 
we know that this virus transmits more easily when, when there's higher rates, so the probability of being exposed to somebody who's not immunized, who um, is transmitting the virus, but also in closed settings, when we're talking loudly, when we have lots of people together. So it may be that uh, mask wearing would be important in those situations for some people, particularly if you're at risk. So it is learning um, from what we know about how the virus is transmitted and where those layers of protection are important. Richard, do you have a follow-up? Uh, Dr. Henry, a health-related, non-education related question. I'm wondering if BC has been asked to share vaccination data with the federal government in order to help build some sort of vaccine passport program and how important is providing the data of British Columbians to ensure that if there is a system at the border that all that system is uh, all that information is available um, the short answer is yes, of course. Uh, so we provide uh, um, aggregate information, um, but in, in terms of a vaccine passport, that is something Canada is working on in, in uh, concert with all of us. And of course, the, the thing that is most important is the uh, protecting of personal health information. So we do have an immunization registry where everybody's dose is in there, or two doses are in there, um, and we need to be able to access that in a safe way for to allow people um, to. Uh, uh, be uh, to have a, a vaccine passport if it's needed and what our expectation is is that we'll have that in place for international travel so yes we are working with uh, the federal government about how they can um, develop a, a Canadian passport that is recognized internationally that uh, links in a confidential way to the information that we have in the same way that you would uh, have uh, your passport next question Binder Sajjan CTV Hi there. Um, I'm just wondering, um, is there a target in terms of vaccination for those aged uh, students aged 12 to 17 um, in terms of you know getting their herd immunity within a school? And would there be possibly different plans uh, for schools or districts that have a lower vaccination rate than that? Uh, the, the short answer is no, there wouldn't be different plans because we know that uh, that uh, the adults in the school system as well are, are being immunized and so it is personal protection as well as protection of, of everybody. And of course it reflects risk in the community, the risk in the school. But obviously we want as many young people from 12 to, to 17 uh, and young people in the school setting to be immunized as possible both for their own protection so they can get back to a more normal existence and a more normal social life that they need, but also to protect their family and communities as well. And I hear from a lot of young people, uh, including my my lovely niece who graduated, had her prom yesterday, um, that you know this is important to them. It's important to them because they want to be part of uh, keeping their family safe but they also want to get their life back and their social life back. And, and that is something that, uh, so we do encourage um, all young people to, to be immunized and now's the time to do it. Binder, do you have a follow-up? Yes, and um, I know you spoke about the ventilation issue. Um, some of the other things that parents are wondering about is, you know, if um, portable classrooms will have hand washing um, if there, you know, the round table issue was kind of uh, a concern for some parents. And just, you know, when you talk about going back to a near normal school year, if you can just lay out sort of what won't be quite so normal or what will be. Well, I will turn it over to the minister for some of this, but just to start, uh, uh, hand hygiene is something that is important in schools, and uh, we've had this program for a long time called Do Bugs Need Drugs, where we talk about the importance of, of washing your hands or cleaning your hands in keeping all kinds of bugs from causing illness, whether it's gastroenteritis, you know, what we call winter vomiting disease, the, the norovirus issues, whether it's influenza, enteroviruses, the common cold, and now, of course, COVID. So I do expect that that will be a routine part of, of school life um, going forward. And that is precisely why the, the $25.6 um, uh, million investment is meant to ensure that we can continue with, uh, with some of the health and safety measures that were in, that were in place. Of course, some districts um, 
use the federal and provincial money uh, the, uh, this year to uh, to make one-time investments in equipment, cleaning equipment, specialized cleaning equipment, hand washing stations, for example. But there are there are provisions in this uh, in in this funding to, uh, to to continue to bolster the the cleaning, um, and districts will make decisions uh, uh, with respect to how to allocate those uh, those amounts best to address their 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 local situations. But I will say too that we we uh, you know we say near normal because we will need to work very hard with all of our school partners to ensure that we continue on um, with uh, a, a, a heightened attention to uh, to health and safety in schools. And so we'll also be retaining the rapid response teams that we put in place earlier this year because those teams, which were joint health authority and school district um, staff teams, were very helpful on the ground in helping to reinforce messaging around the safety plans to help, help with communication. And so we will be paying attention to that and supporting districts in that as well throughout this throughout this up upcoming school year. We have time for one more question. We go to Rob Shaw, Czech News. Binder's question, Dr. Henry, could you like for school aged kids and parents, assemblies with a couple hundred kids in a gym, um, field trips, uh, you know, band recitals and concerts, uh, you know, the kind of things, big huge intramural tournaments with multiple sports teams, is that near normal? Is that all good? Is that what this means? Or can you kind of sketch it out in terms that people might uh, be able to understand for their kids? Yeah, so those are things we believe we can get back to. And it is because we have so many people in the community and in the school community protected. So yes, We'll be looking, though, at, you know, still some of those um, crowding points and making sure that uh, that the, the mixing and mingling in the, in the hallways is still measured. So that might mean timing of classes, timing of people coming and going, how many people are uh, come into the school on a daily basis. And we talked about, you know, parents being more involved in the, in the schools again. Um, this year, they mostly have been kept outside. So, but doing that in a measured way. But yeah, yeah, things like field trips, we, we, we need to get back to those. We know that some children learn best through things like music or um, physical education. So we need to have those opportunities for all children to learn in the ways that, that works for them. And those are important um, parts of, of the school year. So uh, yes, we see those coming back. And the reason why we say um, near normal is because we will need to monitor what's happening in our community, how this virus is spreading, what other things are going on, and we will have a heightened concern about that. So things will transition depending on what's happening around us. And that's where the public health teams will continue to work with the rapid response teams on a community basis. So it may be in some community, if we have transmission of the virus, that those would be suspended for a period of time. So those are the types of things that we're going to have to um, it just uh, work through as we get into the to the coming school year. Rob, do you have a follow up? Uh, in a regular year, uh, school kids are sick all the time. The runny nose, cough. You send them to school unless they have a fever um, because you're worried about childcare, but also about them falling behind. There's no sort of system that guarantees that they stay up on their classwork unless the teacher does that for them. So I'm wondering if any of that changes and what you would say to parents about kids being sick this year, what the threshold is to bring them home, keep them home, and how they kind of manage that question. Yeah, really good question. And I think we learned a lot about that this year because uh, we didn't see, we didn't see any influenza. We saw very little RSV. We saw a little bit of adenovirus and enteroviruses, which cause colds. Um, but the things that we put in place as, as a society and in the schools um, to prevent transmission of disease. And we probably went, you know, um, probably overboard because we had so much concern and we didn't know what was going on. So those, some of those things we've learned are pretty important. So staying home when you're sick is pretty important. And that's why we say near normal. This, this coming year, we are going to have to have that low threshold still for making sure that if somebody in the family has COVID that you, you know, you're staying 
staying away, you're getting tested, you're getting tested for other respiratory viruses too. And this is where it takes our community again. So it's not just on the school. It is a workplaces recognizing that we're still going to have that low threshold and that parents may need to work from home if their child is sick. So those are the things that we as a community need to commit to for this next school year, making sure that we do have the ability to, to keep kids um, caught up on their schooling if and when they have uh, illness, that parents are able to support them staying home and that we can uh, have not as uh, stringent uh, requirements in place as last year, but those health checks are going to be really, really important and we need to stay flexible to support families through this next year too. Thank you very much everyone. That concludes today's event. Columbus, one of those provinces that decided to keep the doors to the education system open. They didn't close the schools. There was outrage and continued outrage from teachers about the decision not to close the schools and does the Ministry of Education truly hold the safety of schools at heart? There was a lot of debate over it. There's a lot of outrage on social media, and the public health office and the Ministry of Education um, seemingly, at times, would ignore such outcries. Well, today the, they have announced that um, an investment of forty-three point six million dollars. Uh, to of support to health and safety measures, especially for um, mental health services, for services serving First Nations and Métis students, and rapid response teams to address all kinds of other learning impacts to students. So, why don't we listen to what um, the Minister of Education for British Columbia has to say along with, um, she has the, a few guests with her from, um, from the education system to help discuss what this particular type of help means and how they're going to plan out the opening of schools in September.
Thank you for listening today, and thank you for supporting us with our sponsors. Please go to depictions.media for more information, and click on our contact link and let us know how we can help, how we can help bring your story and help bring us to a better world. This show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.